for all of uh, the viewers out there in, in the medical profession who are watching, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Vin Gupta. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician and faculty member based at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, part of the University of Washington. Uh, I'm here with uh, uh, Dr. Robert Califf, who, who needs no introduction uh, and certainly has uh, a distinguished career in public service and in academia. Dr. Califf, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Gupta. It's great to be with you. I feel like I'm on CNN and uh, I'm talking to you now from the West Coast. Uh, I know you're a Seattle-based person, so it's really, really good to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Califf, and, and we welcome you with open arms to the West Coast. Um, I, I, so the purpose of this conversation is to is to provide guidance and, and some background to our to our colleagues in clinical medicine on monoclonal antibodies and their use uh, and throughout this pandemic for those uh, who have come down with the diagnosis of COVID-19. Could you provide just a basic background on what monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies are and when they should be licensed? Yes, you know, I think we're all now familiar with the concept that when a virus uh, invades us, um, it exposes um, parts of the virus that activate our immune system, and we make antibodies to basically uh, glom onto the virus and uh, prevent it from doing bad things to us. That's our normal immune reaction. Monoclonal antibodies can be manufactured uh, through a biological process that are specifically oriented to a particular part of the virus and avoid all the other parts of the immune system that may be activated for good or bad reasons. This is a technology, you know, it's fascinating to me because I, I came along in medicine in the late 1970s. At the time, um, there was no ability to manufacture biologics really of any consequence, but monoclonal antibodies were one of the first um, biologics to be made. And in my area of cardiology, the monoclonal antibody to the platelet 2B3A receptor um, was something I worked on a lot. And so at the time it was a fairly crude uh, process, but now um, it's a very refined uh, platform for manufacturing these antibodies that specifically go in and attack uh, the virus at a particular point. Dr. Kalef, how are they being used as treatment for COVID-19? Well, the history here, I think, the recent history is also, I think, fascinating. When, when it became apparent to me and a lot of other people last year that the pandemic was going to be a pandemic, I called Janet Woodcock and I said, okay, we got this problem. What are you doing about it? And she said, one of the most important things is we learned in SARS-CoV-1 uh, the uh, potential pandemic that never evolved to affect us in the United States very much, we learned that uh, therapeutic antibodies could be made that were highly effective. It just turned out we didn't need them, but we know that worked. And so it's going to work in this new virus. And so we need to pay a lot of attention to manufacturing these antibodies. And so, um, you know, a lot of work was done, sort of like the vaccines. The idea is um, if you uh, become infected, um, if you get a therapeutic antibody early, it has a dramatic effect on reducing the risk of getting sick. And that now is proven to include not only not feeling sick, but also not requiring hospitalization. Historically, this is like one of the most effective treatments uh, that I've seen. Dr. Kilf, you know, in speaking to the providers that are most likely to be gatekeepers of this therapy, emergency room physicians, primary care providers, and they're, they're wrestling with getting their patients tested for COVID-19 to potentially try to get them access to, to vaccines, at least in the case of primary care providers. Can you speak to them directly about the importance of monoclonals and, and how that uh, interacts with all these other priorities that, that exist in parallel? Sure, you know, there's a tendency to think about COVID care as first of all, vaccination is number one on our list. And then when people get sick, the uh, amazing uh, intensive care that can be given to save a life. But this is a chance for a primary care doc, an emergency doc, uh, other kinds of clinicians that are talking to patients to really save a life by acting quickly and getting uh, a monoclonal infusion. As I've said before, this is to me, much like a heart attack, there's a finite and very explicit risk of dying or uh, having a very complicated course in the hospital. 
we can prevent it if we act early, just like we've all learned. If someone's having a heart attack, get them to the uh, reperfusion as quickly as you possibly can. In this case, act quickly to get people uh, to an infusion center and you can save a life. I mean, that's an amazing part of being uh, a clinician and a real chance to intervene in a primary care setting. I'd also just like to point out that, um, you know, many people are getting tested in community sites, not connected to a clinician. And so they may end up, uh, it may be someone you don't even know who contacts you saying, I've got a positive COVID test now, what do I do? And this is your chance by asking a few questions to, as I said before, a chance to save a life. Dr. Carroll, if I, I've heard from colleagues across the clinical spectrum, uh, to some degree, some skepticism on the use of monoclonals because it's under EUA, because the research isn't uh, fully out there in the peer reviewed literature in terms of showing clear benefit that a lot of this uh, research is preliminary and not, hasn't gone under peer review. Can you speak to that hesitancy whether it's because these are being utilized under EUA or because the, the research is still early. Uh, what, what would you say to those clinicians out there who might be skeptical on the benefits of, these, of this specific therapy? People should be really reassured. Uh, the companies are not allowed to promote the product. So the decision about the uh, emergency use authorization by the FDA is made by the FDA looking at all the data that's available. It's rock solid. There's no question this treatment saves lives when given to appropriate patients, and it definitely should be used. One uh, feedback I'm hearing from providers, federally qualified community health centers, is that they're already being expected to test, to provide vaccines, and to provide routine care, and, and that providing a separate infusion uh, or area for an infusion uh, center for monoclonals is just asking too much and stressing a system that's already stressed. What can you say in terms of pro, uh, what the government is currently doing to provide added resources to make sure that this therapy is out there for people who need it? Well, first of all, let, let me just make the point that it's amazing the resilience um, on, under great stress of the healthcare system and all the clinicians that are involved in taking care of patients. I was just looking at a survey yesterday about the pressure that people feel and the mental health issues, but they're rising to the occasion. And this is Yet another example where, um, you know, the way I think of it, anyone who dies now from COVID-19, it's especially tragic because we're so close to having everyone vaccinated in a way that will radically reduce the risk of getting infected or dying. And so fortunately, the government is really stepping up. So infusion centers are being set up. There's reimbursement for it. Um, systems are being funded. Um, the connections through the websites are directing people to the right place. So um, I think the message is you're not on your own. Uh, your job is to identify the uh, individual who would benefit and to refer them on. And uh, the system should take care of the rest. If it's not, um, I think your job is to complain about it because um, just like in the early days of heart attack, when people were not being referred for reperfusion because hospitals were hanging on the patients. Now, um, we really need to stimulate our administrators to help us get the systems in place. And I think the government is very much on board and doing everything it possibly can. Could you, for, for everybody watching, just summarize who, what patients are eligible for this treatment, Dr. Kaler? Part of the evolution, I think, as almost everyone knows now of uh, COVID-19 is people get infected, they're asymptomatic for a period of time, then they become mildly uh, symptomatic. And it's two weeks later, a week to two weeks later, if they progress to get sicker, they, they get sick enough to go in the hospital. But by that time, they're in a very different phase of immune reaction where the immune response itself is probably adverse and causing the problem. And so the key is to catch them in that early phase when they haven't mounted their own immune response. And you can then give this targeted antibody to knock out the effect of the virus before they get sick. And in fact, in the trials, if you give the antibody late, at the time people are entering the hospital, um, it's not effective. And so um, it, it's a real logistical problem. You need to catch people uh, right when they're diagnosed and also when they're high risk. So um, high risk is all the things we now know, older age, uh, comorbidities are the, are the two big things 
uh, to pay attention to. And, and just to layer on to, to what Dr. Caleb just mentioned, if if you have any questions on eligibility, please go to combatcovid.hhs.gov. Uh, th there will be links at that website where you can clearly see eligibility criteria for, for, your, for your patients that may meet the following criteria. If they're older than 65, if they have a high risk condition like diabetes or chronic kidney disease, and they're older than, and that in that case, just 12 and older with a high risk condition. Uh, and if they've had the onset of mild to moderate symptoms within the last 10 days of you having that discussion with your patient with a, con a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19, they would meet eligibility criteria, but please go to that website, combatcovid.hhs.gov to learn more. Dr. Kelf, one of uh, the harshest realities of this pandemic has been the stress placed on, on health systems across the country, especially in hotspots um, over the last 14 months. Can you speak to how monoclonal antibody use can actually help alleviate the stress on health systems? I've been looking at the stress on the system from all the common chronic diseases that we already uh, treat, and there's a big buildup in the U.S., and there's a great need for hospital resources, not to mention the fact that our clinicians and staff are under tremendous stress from the um, tremendous amount of work they've had to do due to the pandemic. So reducing the risk of someone going to the hospital by 80 percent is not just a benefit to that person, it's a benefit to the whole system because it makes room for people with other problems that need to be treated. And it alleviates the tremendous pressure that's on the staff uh, under these stressful conditions. So uh, you're not just saving a life, you're also probably affecting the uh, medical care of many other people with other diseases where in an overwhelmed, overwhelmed system, they're not necessarily getting the best care because there's only so much time and energy that clinicians have. Uh, Dr. Califf, in terms of uh, patient benefits and misconceptions, uh, as we've been becoming more familiar with this therapeutic, um, th there's been a lot of confusion about what benefits accrue to the patient. I'm wondering if you can speak specifically or just emphasize the benefits as you see them, and then misconceptions amongst clinical providers about monoclonal antibodies. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a skeptic about medical treatments because in my academic role, I mostly did clinical trials and most treatments, frankly, that were being envisioned, no matter how good people thought they might be, ended up not working. So most, and as FDA commissioner, you know, the, the general statement is 90% of uh, treatments that get into clinical trials don't make it to market because the risks outweigh the benefits when you actually do uh, do the clinical trials. And so, this one though is right up there with the most effective treatments that I've seen. It reminds me a lot of my early days when we were learning how to treat heart attack. You can save a life if you open the coronary artery of someone who has a heart attack. In the same way, a high risk person with COVID-19, uh, you can save the life of that person and also prevent hospitalization. So it's, it's dramatic. And uh, you know, I would just call it a life-saving treatment. So in some ways, it's it, it's it's a different paradigm here that a lot of individuals, to your point, Dr. Caleb, who seek care for COVID are already sick, already perhaps may require intensive care, or they're looking for a vaccine. This is a, a specific subset of patients who have already diagnosed COVID-19 or they've been infected with the virus, they have mild to moderate symptoms, and here we can, here we have the opportunity to intervene with this therapy to prevent progression. So that it's, it's fundamentally different from the other paradigms. That's right, don't wait for people to get sick. You can keep them from getting sick. And that is one of the most amazing things that a clinician can do. So I'd highly encourage asking the right questions and then taking action quickly to get antibody infusions in people who are in the high risk groups that will benefit. Dr. Cook, why, why do you think this has not been utilized more just in the setting of Back in January, we were losing up to 4,500 fellow Americans every day during the worst of this pandemic. Why aren't we utilizing this more? What are the biggest barriers? Logistically, this is not simple. You're taking a person who just got a diagnosis, who doesn't feel that bad, and you're telling them, guess what? You have COVID-19 and you're high risk, and you need to get an infusion of this treatment. That's a lot to take in. And the medical care system is not highly organized to make it 
happen. You need to be under medical supervision when you get the infusion. So it means you got to take somebody who's at home and may be afraid of going into the hospital and getting them to an infusion center where it's being done. So the logistics are complicated. It took us a decade to work this out for acute MI, but we don't have a decade here. Dr. Kill, we're learning a lot more about monoclonal antibodies, um, potentially as a prophylactic measure, if you're at high risk of exposure, and certainly to keep you out of the hospital. Could you summarize what you think are the, uh, are the most compelling research findings to date that would justify their use? The most compelling findings of the clinical trials done to date um, are, are pretty simple. Uh, over an 80% reduction in the risk of serious illness, hospitalization, or death with almost no toxicity of the antibody. So, uh, and again, this is a relative benefit. So it's important to state, you know, let's say your risk of being admitted to the hospital or dying is 10%. That means it's reduced to 2%, you know, roughly. It's not exact, the numbers when it comes to relative risk don't exactly work out that way, but it's a simple way to think about it. So um, it's a big effect. And the, lar the higher your risk to start with, the greater the benefit that's seen. And so that's why it's so critical to identify early on the people who have these high risk characteristics of over age 65 or one of the major medical comorbidities that we all know. I hear from providers uh, who, who ask me questions about whether monoclonals as they exist today would be effective against some of the new variants that, that are being detected. Could you speak to whether or not there is that cross-variant uh, protective benefit? For the most part, the current monoclonals do deal with the current variants that we have. There's already been one exception where uh, one of Lilly's monoclonals given alone is no longer uh, recommended, but in combination of two monoclonals given together is highly effective. And we now have platforms that can pretty rapidly in the course of a few months, produce a new monoclonal to take on a variant that appears. And I, I think, um, I don't think I know that we're ready for it, you know, except in a really surprising situation as the virus evolves, which it will, we'll just adapt the platforms that we already have up and running to produce specific monoclonals for those viruses. And so I think it's important for the practitioner or the clinician to be ready to give the monoclonal antibody. And um, I really th think because of the emergency situation of the pandemic, the system will take care of which one you need to give. One other little thing to mention, under an EUA, the companies can't promote the product. Um, they're prohibited from doing that. So the, the recommendations that you're getting are coming from the government, from the decisions of the FDA and the CDC. And so I think you should be highly trustful uh, the information that's coming out about this now. Dr. Kilt, is, is there any guidance uh, that you provide uh, clinicians across the country that want to utilize monoclonals on, on potential side effects uh, or on other guidance that they should be providing their patients? Like, for example, if you get a monoclonal antibody, there is guidance that you should uh, you should wait at least 90 days before you get a vaccine. As and since everybody's thinking about the vaccine, any other concerns you may have in terms of harm signals, side effects, other considerations? Well, I think your point about the vaccine is a really good one. And I, I would add that, you know, acutely there are things to be aware of. I mean, number one is just be aware of the anxiety that people have and the things that may keep them from even going to the infusion center when you ask them to do it. And during the infusion, there's going to be understandable concern about the general environment. There's a risk of allergic reaction and there are allergic reactions to any infusion of a antibody. And so we have to be concerned about that. Um, but the risk is very low. So medical observation for that acute period. And then it's not 100% effective. And so like any person with an early diagnosis of COVID-19, an appropriate follow-up system with monitoring and contact at regular intervals is needed. There are protocols that are readily um, available on the website that can be, um, that the government runs that can be used to sort of guide the way you follow people. But 
in general, I mean, the great news is uh, if the infusion is given early, the risk is so much lower that bad things will happen. Thank you, Dr. Kellis. And, and just in closing, if a provider is having a difficult time finding this therapy for their patients, where should they go to find more information about locating infusion centers uh, or, or alternative means to access this therapy? Yeah, the guy, uh, on the government website, there's a, U, a UR, URL basically that um, has a mapper that will um, direct you to the nearest infusion site. Thank you, Dr. Califf. And I, if, I want to just thank everybody for watching uh, and taking time out of your day and your busy day and watching Dr. Califf and I talk about monoclonal antibodies. These have been underutilized to Dr. Califf's point. We need to utilize them more often to save people's lives. And so again, if you have questions about access, please go to combatcovid.hhs.gov where you'll find links to this locator that Dr. Califf just pointed out. And just by doing a simple zip code search, you should find infusion centers near you, potentially your own clinical, uh, your own institution or, uh, or, or your place of clinical practice might be offering these antibodies. I personally heard from patients and practitioners across the country that when they do get access to these therapies and provide them for their patients, that anecdotally at least, that the outcomes have been fantastic. And so Please do uh, spread information about this vital therapy. Go to combatcovid.hhs.gov. Uh, and, and, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And, uh, you know, it's all, uh, I, I follow your uh, appearances on CNN, you know, at, at uh, Alphabet or Google. I have uh, access to a lot of information, but your uh, insights and plain talk are tremendously helpful to everyone. So it's much appreciated.